Spirit, Acts chapter 7, and we looked at verse 25, where we saw that um, Stephen began to speak about the patriarchs. Uh, uh, now he's talking about Moses, and he said how Moses was in a hurry to fulfill the promise of God, but it didn't work out uh, the way he desired. Uh, and you know what happens next? Verse 26, and the next day he appeared to two of them as they were fighting and tried to reconcile them, saying, men, um, you are brethren, why do you wrong one another? Okay, so I think I went ahead of this verse, verse 27. But he who did his neighbor wrong pushed him away, saying, who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Verse 28, do you want to kill me as you did the... Egyptian yesterday, 29. Then at this saying, Moses fled and became a dweller in the land of Midian where he had two sons. So, uh, you know, Moses seems to have rushed into God's purposes. And when he saw that the hearts of the people, his own people, who he was supposed to deliver, they were not ready yet um, because of his mistake. So he had to kind of take a detour. So he goes off to the land of Midian. But thank God for his grace that even when uh, someone uh, is off track, God still continues to provide and protect uh, that, you know, all of us, in this case Moses, but God uh, protected him. Uh, his call never went away from him. You know, then, you know, we know the rest of the story. Verse 30, and when 40 years had passed, wow, you know, 40 years, again, 40 years, such a long time uh, th that Moses is walking with the Lord. Uh, and when 40 years had passed, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in a bush in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. So just when Moses is thinking, God, it came into my heart when I was 40 years old, but now here I am in the wilderness because of my own mistake. Uh, have you forgotten your promise to me? But what's happening? It's in those moments where maybe Moses was beginning to, um, you know, lose his grip on the promise of God, that God encounters him in a fresh way. Okay, so an encounter in the wilderness. Okay? It, this is an entire sermon in itself, so I don't want to make it a sermon. Uh, but you see, God is God is speaking. God is speaking through every word. So in the wilderness, God encounters him uh, in the fire, in a bush. Okay, so what was he doing at that time? He was just doing his daily activities. We know that, you know, in Midian, he uh, was more like a shepherd. So he was taking care of his, uh, his, his flocks. But at that time, in the mundaneness of life, God encounters him. So uh, that's so beautiful to know that our God, we might just be having a normal day, but it does, it does not prevent God from encountering us in a powerful way, even in a regular you know, day of our lives. Uh, so verse 31, when Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight. And as he drew near to observe, the voice of the Lord came to him. So on a normal day of his life in the wilderness, the voice of the Lord came to him, verse 32, saying, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses trembled and dared not look. So the encounter which Moses had, God spoke to Abraham when he was not in the promised land. God was with Joseph when he was in Egypt. Now God is speaking to Moses in Midian. Okay, so the encounter is in a completely different place. God is reminding Moses uh, of what he needs to do uh, in and through his life. Verse 33, then the Lord said to him, take your sandals off your feet for the place where you stand is holy ground. Verse 34, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their groaning and have come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send you to Egypt. So finally, you know, the moment has come when God wants Moses to go and do the primary assignment for his life. And all these years, what was happening? Preparation. Preparation was taking place. 
okay uh, in his life so god is encountering moses and he say i want you to go now now is the kairos moment now is the correct time for you to step out and you see how god uh, responds to the cry of his people so one uh, other insight that we can note here is our cries reach god you know we uh, the children of israel in egypt 400 years they would have thought what god what happened can you not hear us we are being oppressed uh, we we want deliverance we want you to redeem our losses we want you to uh, you know take away this destruction from us and they might have thought that time is just passing by and god is not doing anything about our situation but that's not the fact what happens we read here god acknowledging i have surely seen the oppression of my people so god is a god who takes note of whatever we go through even our difficulties our pains our sorrows uh, god takes notice of that i have surely seen the oppression of my people who are injured i have heard their groaning so he can see he can hear and when we call out to him he hears it he heard the groaning of the people and this was the right moment that god picked to deliver now when god wants to bring deliverance generally what do we see in scripture we see that god raises up a man he raises up a woman there was a time when you read the book of judges you have people like deborah you have gideon god raised up people because there was a need for a leader to lead his people and you know he made that possible similarly you know you see at this time when the people really needed a deliverer god has chosen moses and god has prepared moses for all these years to become that deliverer for his people who were oppressed in egypt okay um, and little uh, you know would moses have known how god wanted to do this through his life so god was with moses and god encountered moses in midian okay now verse 35 now just think about this there was an accusation about stephen that he blasphemed god which part about god is untrue in what he say he say the facts you know this god that you are familiar with the god of our fathers uh, this is how he spoke to our fathers okay and he's giving god that due honor and respect so which part about moses is blasphemous in what he say actually nothing he's just stating historical religious facts which the jews already know so they can't catch him in anything that he say okay what what else does he want to say about moses verse 35 this moses who they rejected say who made you a ruler and a judge is the one god said to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush okay so he say we know the story of moses initially he was rejected but he was the chosen one he was the chosen one to uh, lead the people and god encountered him in the wilderness and spoke to him there verse 36 he brought them out after he had shown wonders and signs in the land of egypt and in the red sea and in the wilderness 40 years so finally through moses's leadership with mighty signs and wonders god delivered his people now in what stephen is saying i already told us he is uh, giving them this perspective that it's not about finding god in a geographical location okay that we, we are familiar with. but notice he is slowly bringing the picture of jesus okay if you haven't noticed he talked about joseph who was rejected by his brothers okay now uh, you know bible scholars that this is not the best way of interpreting scripture you know you can pick anything and you can say i i i see something else in it and you know you kind of uh, and it's the last type of uh, you know preaching that that we want to do using allegories and all that so uh, anyway but still if you look at 
the life of Joseph, you could say that there is a type of Jesus in Joseph. Why? Because his own family rejected him. And isn't that the same story with Jesus? Jesus was rejected by his own people. The Jews rejected Jesus. Now, in talking of Moses, Stephen is bringing that same point, verse 35. Moses whom they rejected. So he's reminding the audience that, hey, we have a history of rejecting the man of God sent as a deliverer. Joseph was sent as a deliverer, but the Jews, his own family, what did they do? They reject. Okay, but thank God, somehow, the during famine, they were blessed because of Joseph. Because he was uh, uh, still you know, kind-hearted towards his people. Moses, he was rejected. No, who made you a ruler and judge? Is the one God sent to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush? So Moses, he was also rejected by his own people. Then he went into the wilderness, Midian. However, through his life, God delivered. So he's slowly painting a picture of Jesus and he's saying the way the Jews have treated Joseph, Moses, don't you think, you know, you've done the same to this Jesus who is the Messiah. After all, Joseph and uh, Moses, they were all like shadows before the real deliverer. Real a redeemer who came to us in the person of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So, verse 37 This is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren, him you shall hear. So, notice how Peter preached, he always brought the subject of Jesus. This is good preaching. There is history, there is, you know, explaining, there is facts and all figures, all of that is there. But the central message, the central theme is to, to reveal Christ as Lord. And that is what Stephen is doing. So, you know, if he was doing a, a homiletics uh, um, course, I don't know how many marks his lecturer would have given him. He has covered the key point. Jesus Christ, the Lord. So turning the hearts of the people towards God, right? Uh, he's not wasting a moment. Everything is coming to the central message, which is Jesus. And he is talking about Jesus through Moses. So now they can't reject. The listeners cannot reject this because they honor Moses. So he is quoting Moses for them. And he's saying, Moses who said to the children of Israel, so don't do what I'm telling you to do. Your father or your prophet, Moses, he said to the children of Israel, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet. So didn't Moses tell us there is going to be another person, a prophet like me? So you know, you could imagine, you know, of the stature of Moses or even greater than Moses. From your brethren, so he will be a part of us, he will be Jewish. Him you shall hear. So the, you know, the maiden is going to be passed down to this key individual, prophet whom the Lord is going to raise up. And you have to listen to him. You have to listen to that prophet. Verse 38. This is he who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to, to give to us. So he's explaining a little bit more about Moses. And you know, we know all this. Moses was in the wilderness. He had these encounters with God and he received the teachings of God. Uh, so verse 39, whom our fathers would not obey, but rejected and in their hearts they turn back to Egypt. Now he is also you could say beginning to offend the Jews because he's saying 
you're acting just like the fathers. What did they do? They heard Moses out, but their hearts were so far away from God. They were disobedient. They were complaining. They were, uh, you know, people without faith, unbelief, no patience. Such were the children of Israel. And they rejected. And in their hearts, they turned back to Egypt, saying to Aaron, make us gods to go before us. As for this Moses who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So he's reminding the council of the Jews that even our forefathers, they rejected the prophet whom you respect. They rejected the prophet Moses. And, you know, that whole incident of when Moses went to speak with God and, uh, you know, they made for themselves a calf to worship. So it's like they rejected the prophet of God and they rejected God also. Verse 41, and they made a calf in those days, offered sacrifices to the idol, and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. 42, then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets. Okay, so here there is a parallel. If you read of what Paul will write later uh, to the book to the Romans, he says, or, or rather, you know, it's not later or anything because during this time when, when Luke was writing this, maybe Paul had already uh, penned things out for the Roman church. Uh, but Romans 1, you know, when, when you read, we see there verse 20 that the way God has handcrafted the uh, handcrafted the sky, the way he has, the heavens, the way he has handcrafted this world, he says people do not have an excuse to not believe in God, right? So there is a God and every human being's conscience tells them that. That's what you know, Romans 1.20 says. But later on in that passage, you see how even though people have that uh, inner knowing, they want to do what they want to do. And so later on in the passage, you read that God gives them their own choice. Okay, you want to worship other things, please go for it, no problem. So he's using that same way of writing here in verse uh, 42. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven. Or oh, what is God doing? He's just letting them go and saying, okay, I don't know the truth, but if you still want to do what you want to do, uh, then, you know, it's amazing how God does not control people, how he does not impose, you know, how he does not, um, uh, you know, in, as if in a robotic way, you take away our free will and say, no, you have to worship me. And that is why salvation is a free gift. But those who believe, we are the ones who will walk in salvation. Those who believe, everyone who believes, does that mean some don't believe? Yes, unfortunately. Uh, but it's free, right? It's free will. Uh, free will is involved in receiving salvation or free will is involved in worshipping God. We cannot make anybody worship God. Okay? Even God does not do that. He does not impose. So uh, the, uh, the rejecting children of Israel, the complaining children of Israel, he just let them be. And he said, okay, do whatever you want to do. Uh, and verse 42, the latter part, did you offer me slaughtered animals and sacrifices during 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? Verse 43, you also took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your God, Rephan, images which you made to worship, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. So Stephen is reminding them of an attitude uh, of irreverence which the children of Israel had towards God, towards the prophet Moses. Okay, so he's pointing out how they worshipped other gods. And he mentions verse 43 is tabernacle of Moloch, God, Remphat, these are all Egyptian gods. So just look at these people, right? The, the children of Israel. God showed them so many miracles. He protected them. He heard their cries. He delivered them out of Egypt. But as some preachers have said, 
they came out of egypt but egypt did not come out of them and they carried with them you know the 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 traditions of egypt the the there were there, were, there was a tug on their heart you know for the gods of egypt so they probably were familiar with with certain gods and methods of worship and it just made them feel good uh, and they subscribed to it even though they knew the living god so in a way what stephen is saying is we are not any different from what our fathers did so this part can be very offensive so far the council would have heard about uh, thinking okay he's just narrating uh, our scriptures but now you know uh, this is hard for any listener any jewish listener who doesn't believe in jesus was 44 our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as he appointed instructing moses to make it according to the pattern that he had seen which our fathers having received it in turn also brought with joshua into the land possessed by the gentiles whom god drove out before the face of our fathers until the day of david was 46 who found favor before god and asked to find a dwelling for the god of jacob was 47 but solomon built him a house so all this history is to explain how this temple has come about so encounters then tabernacle in the wilderness eventually solomon built this house okay so now let's see where stephen goes with it verse 48 however the most high does not dwell in temples made with hands as the prophet says so look at this now he's making the hard hitting point come on god does not live in this space he's god he's greater than uh, you know how much this space can hold and he is substantiating it with an old testament scripture so he quotes as the prophet says verses 49 and 50 heaven is my throne earth is my footstool what house will you build for me says the lord or what is the place of my rest has my hand not made all these things so he is substantiating what the point he made with what the scriptures of the audience says okay so as all of us have witnessed you know it's it's a uh, it's a very like you know it's very accurate uh, in its narration and its content so the listeners cannot pick on him about accuracy they cannot pick on him uh, you know to prove what they have been saying so far that he's talking wrong things uh, about certain writers so now with this information before them what is the council going to do okay so he's going to conclude see for this now going to conclude his sermon was 51 he says you stiff necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears you always resist the holy spirit as your fathers did so do you so now he is not trying to cover up he is not trying to uh, you know sugar coat uh, what he means he is putting it out directly he is saying you people you are stiff necked uncircumcised in heart and ears that is to say that you know the religious spirit where on the outside activity wise we are fine but on the inside you know a uh, true heart sincere commitment wise we are so far away from god so he says uncircumcised in heart and ears and he says you always resist the holy spirit now that is an accusation he is making against the uh, council and, and the unbelieving jews as your fathers did so do you this statement is quite accurate actually because he just showed us how the children of israel were disobedient was 52 which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute and they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers 
who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. Okay, so again, no, no. oops, what was that? Okay, there's some uh, noise, I think. Thank you, whoever muted. All right, so we, we are seeing Stephen now, you could say, accused. Okay, the audience uh, and uh, tell them that they are unbelieving not just unbelieving but he's saying you're walking in the footsteps of your fathers who have even killed and murdered the messengers so what is it verse 53 it says who have received the law by the direction of the angels so what is direction of the angels receiving the law by the direction of the angels. So that word angels there, if you look it up in the Greek, it actually means messenger. So it, it is not that angels came and gave the law or anything like that. It's just messenger. God gave the law to his messenger, you know, Moses. And similarly, God gave the his word to his men, whom he raised up, men and women. Uh, and that is how he uh, he shared what was on his heart but he's saying that the jews have rejected so far what god has been doing and not just that they have even gone to the extent of killing the messengers and there is a mention of jesus here though we have not heard the word the jesus over here we we know that um, he quoted Moses where he said, Moses said that there will be another prophet. You, know, you hear him. So he's talking about Jesus. And in verse 52, he says, foretold the coming of the just one. Who is that just one? Obviously, the righteous one, the Lord Jesus Christ. So they would have got the point. So what is he trying to say? He's saying, ultimately he's saying, you did not believe Jesus. You did not and you are not believing messengers who are talking about Jesus. Okay, so such is the uh, defense and the speech of Stephen. Once again, he's filled with the Holy Spirit. What did we see um, when it came to the apostles standing before the, the Sanhedrin, the council? They had boldness, isn't it? Boldness is one of the, the um, expressions of, of being filled with the Holy Spirit. So even in this case, tell me, an ordinary man standing in front of the council, he's not trying to cover up anything. He's telling things as they are. Okay, uh, Maybe they, they needed to hear it this way. And so he's not politically, politically right anymore. So it's the end of his sermon and he just gives it to them. So what is going to happen to Stephen? He spoke so boldly, filled with the Holy Spirit, you know, uh, with, with all the facts. Verse 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. You remember this cut to the heart? We saw it earlier in Acts chapter 2. But that cut to the heart led to a positive reaction. This cut to the heart is not leading to a positive reaction. So they are cut to the heart and they gnashed at him with their teeth. That simply means grinding their teeth. Okay, why are they grinding their teeth? Verse 55, you know, wait, let's read further. But he being full of the Holy Spirit gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. So I'll just read verse 57 and come back. Verse 57. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stop their ears and ran at him with one of God. So I told you, cut to the heart, gnashed at him with their teeth. Why? In opposition, in anger, in rejection. Okay, They are grinding their teeth against Stephen. And this was too much for them to take. And after all, this is some believer of that so-called gathering uh, of Jesus followers. So it's okay. We can, we can deal with this man. So that is their take. And they are very angry. They were cut to the heart. It hit them hard. But their response is more of anger. Okay? And it's not of accepting the fact that they have rejected. 
their own god who they talk about but on the other side what about stephen in a moment like this when he's been tried and this gives us so much of comfort and confidence he's filled with the holy spirit and it's almost like you know he is having a vision he gazed into heaven it says so most likely he's having a vision he's looking into heaven what does he see he saw the glory of god so heaven is filled with the glory of god stephen is seeing the glory of god and he sees jesus standing at the right hand of god okay so quite different from what we read about uh, um, is it colossians where we read that uh, uh, or ephesians uh, seated at the right hand of god so jesus seat ephesians colossians yeah so jesus is sitting okay over there uh, but in this case strangely uh, luke says that stephen saw jesus standing at the right hand of god and stephen said this look i see the heavens open and the son of man standing at the right hand of god now we might wonder how did luke come to know because stephen said it he said i see heavens open and the son of man standing at the right hand of god so jesus was standing when stephen had a vision of god <coughs> god is so gracious to give visions at a very difficult time even in the midst of a trial what is happening a man of god a child of god you know god encounters that child and stephen has a vision do you think a vision would have strengthened him at this point definitely you know there could be all these human faces that are angry and uh, you know we see later on they cried out with a loud voice stop their ears so his natural eyes can observe uh, very disturbing scenes in front of him but his spiritual eyes are seeing the glory of god what do you think his heart would have been consumed with he saw heaven open he saw the glory of god he saw the son of man standing at the right hand of god i feel that he would have been gripped with the scene of heaven much more then you know did he have fear looking at people shouting at him and all maybe he did but i i feel that he probably uh, was more caught up in the scene of heaven and rejoiced in the scene of heaven uh, verse 57 says they were against him right and towards the end with one accord again you know cut to the heart one accord in a completely opposite uh uh they uh, here one accord for the wrong things so even the mob or, or the council is against uh, not the mob yet but the council uh, is against him against stephen at this point was 58 and they cast him out of the city and stoned him and the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named saul so they had a practice of punishing uh blasphemers why was stephen stoned you know it was a proof that he was blaspheming anything from their points uh i don't think that came through from his speech but you know towards the end he started telling them you are stiff necked and you have rejected you have killed the, the prophets who spoke about the just one now there was so much in anger i don't even know whether they wanted to wait and find a logical conclusion okay uh, what did he say what should be done to they they were just in outrage and you know when people are in outrage it leads them to do crazy things so there was no moment of pause they just dragged him cast him out of the city it says and stoned him that was their way of punishing um, you know for such crimes and in this case blasphemy and the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul so it seems like somebody was leading the 
the killing of Stephen. For people to come and lay their clothes at the feet of a certain person seems like that person was a leader. So once Stephen was killed, they laid down their clothes at the feet, not the clothes of Stephen, their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. So sir, there was a young man named Saul who was leading you know, the, uh, this team against Stephen. Now, we all know who this Saul is, but notice Saul is in Acts 7, way before, you know, we read about him uh, in Acts 9, when he has an encounter on the road to Damascus. So what is the kind of person he is in Galatians? Uh, you know, Paul talks about himself. He describes himself a little bit more there. And in Philippians, in fact, he uh, points this out. Philippians 3, he points out that he was zealous. He was zealous for for uh, his, his uh, religion, okay, all along. So here, Acts chapter 7, verse 58, shows us how zealous he was, that he was one of those people who was proud to... Um, take down Stephen, you know, a, a man who was accused of blasphemy Blasphemous against his God. Okay, so uh, that is the first introduction of Saul for us in the book of Acts. Okay, and one more thing which we can uh, register in our minds right now is you remember we said that there were these the, the synagogue of the freedmen and then it had uh, it had the regions over there Alexandria and some other regions so there's also the region of Cilicia okay so Paul Saul is from the region of Cilicia so he could have been a member of the Sanhedrin from the region of Cilicia. Okay, so just keep these details in your mind. We will uh, look more into Paul's life as we go forward. So verse 59. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Anyone else who said receive my spirit? Jesus. Yeah, Jesus. So Jesus said, receive my spirit. And similarly, Saul is crying out to the Lord and he's saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Now, I don't think I explained Jesus standing, isn't it? So in his vision, Stephen saw Jesus standing. Even later, we will see how Jesus talks to Saul, a persecutor. Okay? Jesus talks to him in his encounter he says, why are you persecuting me? Jesus will say. So talking about persecution, you know, when God's people are persecuted, he takes it very personally. Jesus never said, we'll see later on in Acts 9, he never said, uh, Saul, why are you persecuting my people? On that road to Damascus, he says, why are you persecuting me? So when God's people are persecuted, it's as if all that is happening to Jesus himself. You see, God takes it like that. Jesus takes it like that. Okay, and such a such comfort, you know, uh, from that thought. And in this case, as Stephen saw heaven open, Jesus is not sitting. You know, some theologians say that Stephen's vision of Jesus standing is like God commending the, the people who have been persecuted for his name's sake, the people who, uh, and we know that Stephen was martyred, but it's like Jesus standing up and giving a, you know, a standing ovation to somebody who had run his race well and said, hey, you have fought a good fight and I'm so proud of you that you did not uh, give up. Uh, you lived for your faith. And, uh, you know, it, it's just like, uh, it, it moves us, right, to, to think that Jesus would stand up to welcome a martyr. Okay, so that is the difference where Stephen is actually looking at Jesus saying, oh, well done. You've done a great job. 
don't worry about the body. Remember, Jesus said, don't be afraid of those who destroy uh, the body. You must fear the one who is able to destroy more than that spirit, uh, right? He, he can put the spirit in hell. And who has that ability? God has the ability. So our fear must be, our reverence and awe must be towards that God and, and not so much about you know, people and pleasing people. So God was looking at Stephen. Jesus was looking at Stephen and saying, you know, you have kept your reverence towards him. You did not let these earthly, um, you know, this earthly counsel scare you. You've done what is the right. And so Jesus was standing up and welcoming, in a sense, the martyr uh, into his kingdom now. And uh, it must have been such, uh, such an encouragement for Stephen in his last moments to uh, see the very Lord Jesus. Again, you know, we can talk so much about it. Maybe the, Stephen could have had uh, a vision of the angels standing up and clapping or you know, something like that, a crowd kept for him. But Jesus was standing. So it, it was God, you know, personally encouraging, commending, applauding, welcoming his persecuted child soon to be a martyr you know into his heavenly kingdom uh, and uh, you know that is that is incredible that is amazing uh, and of course this whole troop of uh, stoning uh, stephen it was led by saul we've seen he's one of those learned men from cilicia Verse 59, and they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. So a little bit more about Stephen. Okay, so he is surrendering to God. In, even in those moments, he says, okay, God, just receive my spirit. Maybe he recognized, okay, this is it. That he, he will not make it. Okay, he didn't say, Lord Jesus, heal me. Because maybe he just had that uh, witness in his spirit that uh, it's time for me to um go to heaven it's the end of my life and verse 60 then knelt down and cried out with a loud voice lord do not charge them with this sin and when he had said this he fell asleep okay so as if all the description about stephen did not uh, was not enough for us to be you know saying wow what a man the last verse here he says he knelt down he didn't pray for himself what did he say? He said with a loud voice, Lord, he prayed for the others. He said, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. So this shows us what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to really, if he had uh, spoken the sermon spitefully, with bitterness in his heart towards the Jews, I don't think when he is breathing his last, he would say, God, don't charge them with this sin. He would have said, God, give them a very good punishment for what they have done. But just the way Jesus, forgive them, Lord, they know not what they do. A, a representative, what did Jesus say? He said, Shall we, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you shall be my witnesses. Isn't this being a witness for Christ in speech, in faith? in boldness, in deed, in compassion, in forgiveness. Okay, and what else do we, you know, see in Stephen's life? We see wisdom, we see power. What a witness. This is Acts 1-8 in demonstration. Okay, he's ready to give up his own life. He just, he understands. Okay, God, you are the receiver of my spirit. This is the end of my life. So he says, okay, Lord, receive my spirit and then finally prayer of forgiveness for his persecutors lord do not judge them with this sin and when he had said this he fell asleep okay so the doctor luke is saying that stephen fell asleep in the new testament this is the language which is used for believers who die in christ fell asleep because we will rise up again. So physical death is not permanent because of the redemption uh, which 
we have received through the Lord Jesus Christ. So I was really hoping that I will touch Acts 8 and I was trying to go like a train, but my train is not fast enough. I think I have to stop. It's 10, almost uh, uh, you know, 10.46 now. Maybe we can talk about what we have learned so far, four more minutes, any thoughts, comments, insights, and then Acts 8, hopefully, you know, next class onwards this is going to get faster okay so anything that you all want to add to what we've been talking about yes christopher oh yes pastor so i just wanted to um i just uh, uh go through um the, the verse act 748 However, the Most High does not live in houses made by human hands. And um, uh, I mean, does this mean that, uh, you know, the the churches uh, that that are built now, uh, you know, should not have, you know, uh, should not have idols, should not be, you know, uh, you know, very uh, ornate, should not be, you know, very, uh, uh, should not really, people should not spend much money on it um and um because god doesn't dwell there he dwells you know everywhere basically and uh yeah so just wanted to get some view on that uh so christopher uh, like scripture is quite clear even when we studied about the house of god uh the body of christ we we've seen how uh and the temple temple uh, of god we've seen how we are told that you are the temple or the people of God, we are the temple of God. And uh, Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in their midst, he will be. So his presence is in the midst of the believers. So it's not so much about the physical building. Yes, the physical building is blessed by the presence of God, which comes when believers pray, they worship, and you know, uh, they, they invite God. Okay. So that is one point uh now should much be done regarding the beauty of of the the uh, you know places of worship i think that is up to the people if if people want to uh, make that place beautiful then that's fine that's okay but uh, that's not the primary focus i don't know if i answered your question Yeah, my question was just a little bit extended towards, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, having it, you know, with a lot of statues and, you know, um, idols and, you know, I mean, there are denominations that still, you know, have that. Okay. Um, and some of the churches are also very, uh, are really beautiful, you know, I mean, some of the churches even in, you know, in Europe and uh, yes. uh, even churches in India. So I just wanted to understand should that be the practice uh you know uh, now or should it just sort of you know be just simple and uh... okay so uh so if you're talking about uh, this this culture of having you know ornate uh, churches church buildings steeple all that uh you could say that some of that stems out of uh, this belief that god lives there and it's a house of god Okay. But we know that it's the people who actually make it the house of God. Um, so yeah, that belief that only these physical buildings are where God uh, lives, that would not stand you know, alone by itself. So yeah, there's no, no need to spend so much on uh, just the external building anymore. Okay, sure. Thank you. And uh, I think uh, Tarun has uh, uh, a scripture here in the chat. It's it's for Christopher, is it Tarun? Exodus 20. Uh, yeah, yeah. In, okay. Can you fact, explain I that? Was, I was just reading about Hall of Heaven Stones, which is the actually the Hall of the Sanhedrin. That's the only building which is built with uh, Heaven Stones is uh, like if you use some tools, 
to cut the stones it's called heaven stones now in exodus god makes it very clear when we build the temple we have to pick up the natural stones and not use any tool on it for example if you use iron to cut the stones it, it might carve into an image and that might lead to idolatry that's the kind of detail that uh, god was very keen on and he writes in exodus like it's uh, clearly written that you should just use the stones in the in the shapes and sizes that we find naturally to build the temple and not try to even okay. carve it uh, likewise it, 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 there are like so many implications like if you uh, iron is actually uh, used for weapons of war and uh, iron is not supposed to be used on the stone that's the kind of detailing that god went when it was uh, because temple is meant for peace and not for uh like shortening the life uh, which war does but to extend the life so you need to be very careful about idolatry when it comes to building the temple uh, so that yeah that's that's the verse i just wanted to refer yeah thanks uh, tarun and uh, very interesting there if you have any links please to uh, leave it on our stream page we have put for everyone uh and, and uh, because of the paucity of time i think we will wrap up here but i we can pick up a little bit more on on this uh, subject in the next session uh say we'll take up your question then okay so thank you everyone god bless you have only 8 minutes to connect to your next class all the best to you uh i'll i'll see you next week have a great weekend thank you pastor thank you thank you thank you pastor Thank you.